don't, you don't need to wear your headsets. The whole, the whole session will be in English, <coughs> no worries. Just relieve our, yourselves. And uh, it's just for our audience with one or two sentences in the beginning and uh, before one break and in the end. I'd like to welcome you all in Al Arabiya session. Thank you all for coming. Murshahid Al Arabiya, ahlan bikum fi hadi al jalsa. Nahnu huna fi Davos, fi Switzerland, li taqtiyat al muntada al iqtisadi al alami. Wa nahnu nudir jalsa hiwariya hawla mawazin al qwa fi al alam al arabi. Saatahadat bilugha al inglesia li anha al lugha al rasmiya huna fi hadi al muntada. Dear viewers, today we are here to rethink the balance of power in the Middle East. In the past, the region witnessed two major regional powers, Arabs and Israel. Today, seven years after the fall of Baghdad, Iran emerged as the third power. Let us have a look at the Middle Eastern map according to the new balance. Iran is going nuclear and already influencing events in Iraq, Lebanon, occupied Palestinian territories in Yemen. Israel has been nuclear since the 60s and the dominant conventional power, still in a state of war with Arabs and Iran. Arabs are united against Israel, divided in dealing with Iran. Oil Gulf countries fear Iran, while Damascus, Damascus is ally of Tehran. There are many issues to raise today about this complicated and dangerous triangle, and we will discuss it with our dear guests. Please, let's welcome and start with Mr. Anwar Girgash, Minister of State of Affairs of United Arab Emirates. Mr. Amr Musa, Secretary General of the Arab League. Mr. Salam Fayyad, Prime Minister of Palestinian National Authority. Mr. Samir Rifai, Prime Minister of Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. William Hague, Shadow Foreign Minister from the Conservative Party from United Kingdom. And Khaled Janahi, Chief Executive of Dar al Mal al Islami from Bahrain. Mr. Musa, I'd like to start with you first. So it was easy in the beginning. It was Arabs against Israel. Now it's complicated. It's Arabs against Israel, Arabs against Iran, and vice versa in both cases. So why not say Iran is good if it becomes nuclear? Because it will balance the power of Israel as a nuclear power in the Middle East. Well, uh, I believe that a part of what you have said is not really accurate. To equate Arab against Israel with Arabs against Iran, there is a difference. There are differences between us and Iran. Uh, there are uh, problems. Uh, but it could be those problems could be dealt with through negotiations, through the International Court of Justice, through uh, dialogue. Uh, and after all, it is part and parcel of the Middle East. As for Israel, this is a totally different story. There is an occupation, continued aggression, and a situation that is untenable with Palestinians un living under occupation for many years. Part of them is under siege. Uh, the other part, uh, their, their territory is being settled, changed. Settled meaning they are changing the demographic composition of the Palestinian territories, changing the, demo the geographical characters of the territories. This is a very serious business. In your introduction, you mentioned Iran, you mentioned Israel. I also would mention Turkey. But in all cases, the region is an Arab region. The Arabs are over 300 million individuals with a lot of richness and a lot of uh, human resources. So it is not easy to talk about any balance of power without taking this critical mass of people, of culture, of, of civilization, of wealth into consideration. Yes. Mr. Haig, so Arabs look, seem, as Mr. Musa said, they're okay with nuclear Iran. 
Why are you bothered the West with nuclear Iran? <coughs> well, I'm not sure that they are all okay with a nuclear Iran. I think uh, many people are very concerned just Mr. Musa, huh? about that. Uh, although I was very pleased he mentioned Turkey, because I think this yeah. is, Turkey has a very, very important role to play Definitely. in the future of Europe's relations with the Middle East. And I think Europe uh, moving away in some way, some parts of Europe moving away from supporting Turkish membership of the European Union is a great strategic error because it, uh, Turkey is a great channel between the Middle East and, uh, and Europe. But on your question about Iran, why should we be worried about it? Well, because we should think another step ahead. Uh, what happens if Iran develops uh, a nuclear <coughs> weapons capability? And really then, uh, what is uh, one of two things will happen, either that many other nations in the Middle East, several other nations in the Middle East at least, will wish to develop their own nuclear weapons capability. Uh, that, of course, creates a very dangerous dynamic, and it means the non-proliferation treaty, the global non-proliferation treaty against the spread of nuclear weapons would be in ruins. The alternative to that is that some nations in the Middle East will seek new security arrangements and new security guarantees from Western nations, particularly from the United States, uh, bringing an additional security complication into the Middle East, and to some people, an unwelcome one. And so if we think ahead of the consequences of Iranian uh, nuclear <coughs> weapons capability, it really does upset whatever you would describe as the balance of power in the Middle East. Mr. Janahi, uh, as Mr. Musa said, Arabs are rich. They are really rich, loaded with money, money from oil. Why the money doesn't go to developing nuclear uh, weapon, nuclear power, or probably invest in military uh, advancements rather than infrastructure, or I don't know where the money goes. Well, I, I'm hesitant to agree and disagree with Mr. Musa and disagree with Mr. Haig, too. Uh, the Arabs are rich as Arabs, but as people, they're not rich. I mean, especially we look at the past 10 years, to the contrary, actually, the gap between rich and poor in the Arab world has just gone so big. That's scary. So, Where's the money? The money? You better ask Amr Musa and the <laughs> five type, the, the guys with the ties here. And by the way, they are the paid politicians. That's why they have ties. I'm the unpaid one. So. <laughs> well, we need to double check on this. Yeah, really. um, but I think the point of the wealth in terms of the wealth going around in the Arab world, that's something we've got to look at. And I hope we're going to discuss it during the discussion time, because that's a very, very important issue to discuss. But I disagree, and I agree. Well, I disagree with you, and I agree with Amr Musa when it comes to the people issue. We are 300 million people. So-called people are really worried. I would say, well, really putting it as a good accountant I am, being trained in UK as a chartered accountant, I would say around 50 million people to the maximum out of the 300 million would be going along with Mr. Hague. But the 250 million, if you go across the Arab world, they have no problems with Iran being nuclear. They have no issues on that. The issue is how they live their day. The issue is how they're going to make the best for their children coming tomorrow. The issue is how we're going to get work for the yes. people coming in 10 and 15 years. Yes. And the issue is how the women will be looked after. This is debatable problem. because if we go to Iraq and ask some people in the streets of Iraq where Iran has a major power, uh, probably they have different viewpoint. Let's ask Mr. Fayyad, uh, do you want Iran as a third regional power in the area? How are you influenced by this reminding of uh, the good relationship between Hamas and Iran? I believe what we should all want is a nuclear-free region uh, in a military sense. This will not happen, Mr. Yeah. And I can tell you, uh, this does not require as an objective that other countries in the region acquire that capability. But this goes to something that really has not changed. You're talking about change in the balance of power in the Middle East, and that is not so unnatural. As a matter of fact, there has been change in balance of power uh, in other regions around the world. What has stayed fixed and constant, actually, is the, the Arab-Israeli conflict continuing to be unsettled. And that in my view, has provided an impetus for continued instability. That's the core issue, and that's what we really all should be uh, concerned with. Uh, Nuclear-free uh, Middle East in a military sense, I think, is an important objective. And uh, as I said, one need not look for that capability having to be developed elsewhere in the region in order for us to get to that conclusion. Mm -hmm. Mr. Gargash, um if we look at Iran today and all the media reviews, a lot of people are talking about 
military strike done by Israel on Iran. Yesterday, Ali Larijani said, I wish Gulf countries don't allow U.S. to use the, their headquarters in the uh, Gulf to launch attacks towards Iran. Uh, is the Gulf countries, are the Gulf countries uh, the front line for this war? Uh, Americans, do they ask you before la launching such an attack? I think first, first and foremost is that uh, the, the last thing the Gulf countries want is another, uh, another confrontation. We've seen too many confrontations, and we think that uh, issues that are important to us, and one of them is the transparency of Iran's nuclear program, should be resolved uh, within a negotiated framework. And we're very uh, hopeful that the current uh, proposals uh, are actually addressed by Iran more positively. Having said, having said that, uh, the, what is scary about the whole issue is that the issue has an international, international dimension that goes far beyond the capabilities of uh, Gulf states or, in fact, Arab states to keep it in check and to keep it in control. So while Arab states will work very you know, diligently at uh, trying to foster a stability and a negotiated way out, uh, many of the uh, dimensions of, of the Iranian nuclear program are international dimensions. They are not really completely within our uh, control. OK. Mr. Musa. So let's remember when Saddam Hussein uh, invaded uh, Kuwait. And then a few months after that, he threw a few missiles on Israel. Arabs back then were just lost. They couldn't stand by Saddam, and they couldn't stand by Israel. So today, if Israel decides to launch a military strike or surgical strike on Iran nuclear uh, uh, facilities, where do Arabs stand? First, I don't want to remember all those. Uh... It's good to remember, sir. <laughs> Not every time and every day, but uh, look, as the minister has said, none of us is ready to support any military strike in the region against Iran. So how many, how much time? I'll tell you, you something. No, no, no. Now we are still in the period of dialogue and negotiations. And a military strike will not solve the problem. There will be an action and there will be a serious reaction. This would launch, would put the whole region of the Middle East and the Arab world in a very difficult, insecure, and perhaps destructive situation. Maybe not. No, 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 maybe, Saddam, yes. Saddam here, regime fell here, there in is one no, week. Here, there is no maybe or maybe not. Why? How? We have what to be expect? very careful about that. Any military action, especially Israel against Iran, is not approved by all of us or any of us. The minister from Emirates has just expressed the same view. And I believe it is only logical and reasonable to give diplomacy its time. Why giving diplomacy time on Palestine a year after year after year after year? Because the, and with Iran, because there is the no clock, time. Because the clock is ticking and the bomb the is... The clock is ticking on what? And on an its way. On what? You have time to wait. About what? Until what they the, develop a nuclear the clock bomb. Is ticking. Ticking where? Maybe they are developing a nuclear bomb now. And what about Israel? It's already nuclear. Look, the Arab League, the Arab League has hired experts to go through all the reports of the IAEA and other international reports mm. to see exactly where does Iran stand now on the question of nuclear development, military or non-military. Yes. The result was that the IAEA, which is the agency working in this and responsible for this uh, issue, there is no determination at all that Iran has moved or crossed the threshold yeah, towards military Yeah, but the American military, intelligence report is different from 2007 so now. So this is and the case, saying it's why is the, how can you say that the clock is ticking? Yes. OK, Mr. Rifai, so the world is rosy, the Arab world is beautiful, Israel is the only problem, no problem with Iran. This is what we understand now. The no, I don't say no problem. There the, are problems. The, the, the world <laughs> Not immediate problems. No, 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 no. There are problems. There are differences. We have a case on this, the islands here. We have other cases of this. So Lebanon is not a case. Palestine is not a case. Yemen is not a case. 
mm. but it is not the same problems yes. or the same magnitude of problems with Israel. Mr. Rifai. The world is far from, from rosy. We all uh, know that. However, one of the main issues, if not the main issue uh, in our part of the world, is the, the Arab-Israeli conflict and the Palestinian issue. Remove that off the table, and then we can discuss balance of power. There is no balance of power right now when everybody, regardless if there are excuses or some people use it as an excuse, but the lightning rod of uh, all conflicts are Palestine. So there is, there is no balance right now. It's very difficult to assess whether there is balance or not balance when you've got a major issue that has to be discussed. Yes. On the issue of, of the nuclear uh, program, it is the right of any country to look at energy security for peaceful purposes in a very transparent way using an international yardstick that is used across the board. But that, so we shouldn't mix up the issues in terms of the nuclear file and uh, the Palestinian yes. issue. The core issue is Palestine. Yes, it's the mother cause and we'll be discussing Palestine in details by the second half of this uh, session after the break. Mr. Higg, I will come back to you. Uh, then uh, first I'll go to the audience and uh, uh, we need to hear your questions. Uh, and I'll be back to Mr. Rifai also with uh, uh, more questions. So as I understood, Iran doesn't pose itself as a threat to the Arab world and Israel is the only threat. So I don't know if anyone would like to participate yes please go ahead and uh, if you can introduce yourself please your name and the company you work for Asfari, one second please Sausan Asfari the Galilee Foundation I just want to clarify one thing in your introduction not all Arab countries are wealthy it's mainly the Gulf countries that are and not all Arabs are against Israel as we can see what's happening with Egypt and Jordan but I'd like a question for Mr. Musa uh, how are you, by the way? Um, do you speak for all the Arab countries that they're against a strike on Iran? Um, does that include Saudi Arabia as well? Should I answer? Yes, please. Feel free. I am sure uh, at that I am speaking on behalf of the vast majority of the Arabs, members of the Arab world. They cannot side by Israel against Iran. And another military aggression against uh, in the Middle East will affect us for so many years to come. It will create a situation of instability, of tension, of terror, of action and reaction, question of confrontation and counter-confrontation, that will be against the interest of all Arab countries in the Middle East. Yes. Yeah, I just follow up on, on since Jordan was mentioned, the, uh, Jordan is, uh, does have a peace agreement with uh, Israel, so does Egypt. Um, we're working very hard together with all of the Arab world through the Arab Peace Initiative to reach a, f a final status for peace between Israel and the entire Arab world and its core Palestine. Yes. So we'll uh, discuss this is the peace. That we are all Just working. Let's for. keep the peace uh, till the end of this session or the second half. I'll hear Mr. <laughs> Ali from uh, Lebanon, Ali Hamadi. Uh, he's a journalist. I introduced you now. <laughs> Ali from Al Nahar newspaper in Lebanon. Uh, it's, uh, it's a rather uh, a remark, not a, uh, a question. I would like to know what do you think that in uh, the Arab world there is two speeches, the official speech that we heard from uh, Mr. Musa, and an unofficial speech. They all wish that Iran would be attacked by the US or by Israel. Is it true? Is it untrue? Uh, Mr. Prime Minister Rifai, perhaps another, Mr. Fayyad. Thanks. Mr. Fayyad. First of all, you know, I'm not very really sure I agree with the uh, conclusion, the way you concluded the sense of the first round of interventions. It is not without consequence. Uh, I mean, the, the, this business of Iran acquiring uh, weapon, nuclear, nuclear weapon capability. It's not without consequence to the Arab world. It has to really, the issue has to really be looked at in the broader political context in which all of this is happening. And also other aspects of bilateral and regional relations. The issue definitely can be discussed at the level of the region and internationally. And so far as we are concerned with the region, what we look at are other sets of issues, including, for example, 
interventionism, the extent to which a country in the region respects uh, uh, mutual, uh, mutually uh, workable relationships with its partners, with its regional partners and neighbors. Uh, clearly, that's a consideration. So it is not entirely clear that one can say that it is of no consequence whatsoever. Yes. It is definitely uh, of some consequence. Can, can I just Quickly, please. Yeah. yeah. I think, I think uh, it, it is uh, not in the interest of any of the Arab states for any military confrontation in the Gulf. Uh, the repercussions uh, will be very heavy, and the repercussions will carry on for many years. Having said that, uh, the onus is also on Iran to deal uh, in, in, uh, in a very cooperative and flexible manner with the overtures of the international community. Uh, there are uh, a lot of proposals on the table. The latest was, for example, the uranium swap, and that's a way out. And it failed. Uh, and, but, and Iran didn't but, answer but, the but, world, but, didn't reply. But, but the point is, the point is, this is the international dimension kicks in. This is where the Arabs also have, you know, as much as the issue of the nuclear program is a regional issue, it is also an international issue. Yes. And we, as people who share this yes. region with Iran, yes. say Iran has to be uh, proactive in this and positively uh, proactive. Yes. In the, in the UAE, for example, we have started a peaceful nuclear program. In Abu Dhabi. In Abu Dhabi, yes. And we've started it, and we have made sure that this program actually paves the way for a program, we call it the gold it's standard. It's also strange timing, sir. Why is it a strange timing? Why Iran is probably developing its nuclear... No, uh, you, don't, you don't come and invest in, in a program this large and in a program this complicated as a reactive measure. But part of it is we are also yes. showing that the Middle East can actually acquire a nuclear power in a very transparent way. Yes, and we urge the point all is clear. Please let me pass now, uh, read one of, I'll come back to you, I one of the just questions. Just a question about Jordan having a private and a Please public. Please allow uh, me first to read the question by YouTube. We thank YouTube for all the uh, uh, responses we got on this se session. Everyone who participated in this, thank you so much. One of the questions was, the world has witnessed the bombing of the Iraqi and Syrian nuclear facilities, yet the reactors in North Korea and Iran remain untouched. Would the international community prefer to keep the Arab world out of the nuclear balance of power? And is that a good or bad thing? Mr. Haig, this question is for you. I hear that Arabs don't have a problem with Iran now as much as they have a problem with Israel, whereas the world, the biggest problem now is Iran rather than Israel. So where do you stand on this? Well, I think you've heard a number of things. I think uh, some Arabs have an di entirely different problem with Iran from the problem with Israel. Uh, that is absolutely... Uh, the case. It's not uh, as immediate as I understood from them. Well, uh, there was something in the, and I must come back to this new question. Remember, there was something in the question from, uh, from our friend in uh, Lebanon, and I don't want to exaggerate it, but as a shadow foreign minister, I can say things that not all foreign ministers uh, until, can, uh, until June. can until say. <laughs> and then once I am uh, I'm the foreign minister, I will say, no, all foreign ministers speak, say the same in private as in public. Uh, but. There is a difference because there are, there are some countries around the region who uh, do not make speeches that are hostile to Iran's intentions, but then they do say to Western nations, you must do something. Uh, about, <laughs> not, not I'm not saying they call for military action, but you must do something about uh, the, what is happening, the, the nuclear intentions of Iran. And so that is why... They whisper it is so in your important. ears? It is important. No, it's not just whispering. Um, uh, that is why, uh, that is an indication of how important it is to deal with this issue. The countries that will lose out most, that will be destabilized most, if nuclear weapons are acquired by Iran, are the Arab nations. Uh, and so it is very important. There is nothing that is uh, in this approach and in, yes. in the way we are trying to work with Iran to make sure there is the peaceful development of nuclear power in Iran. Nothing in that is hostile to Arab nations in the way that your questioner fears. Yes. I'd like to pass the question to Amir. Uh, please, we'd like to hear your question and then we come back to Mr. Rifai. Uh, Amir Paiva, BBC Persian Television. I uh, take the liberty, as Iran is underrepresented in this panel, and we're all talking about it, to play devil's advocate, and with devil I don't mean it literally. I was struck by the comment about um, this region being an Arabic region, 
that's not how Iranians see it. Uh, only 30 years ago under Shah, they were considered the superpower, the regional superpower here. And uh, there is a, there's a, a, a eagerness to go back to, uh, to that. Uh, sim uh, it, it's interesting when, where we choose to see the history. Uh, look at Iran as a lonely country. It has three options, either to um, be mates with a superpower far from the region, i.e. US, it didn't work. Uh, Iran f finds US intervening in its uh, 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 domestic issues. Or in a regional arrangement, and Iran cannot count on Arab countries because when Saddam Hussein invaded Iran, the whole Arab countries stood behind Saddam Hussein. It was only after Saddam invaded Kuwait that actually Saddam as, in, as the evil was recognized. Yes. And the third one is uh, to be independent on its own. That's why probably Iran is acquiring nuclear power. What would you suggest for Iran as a lonely country? It's not part of the Arab world, it's not part of the pan-Turkish, it's not part of the uh, former Soviet Union. What, would you, what security arrangement would you suggest for a country like this? Mr. Haig, please, can you take I'd suggest question? I'd suggest a much uh, <coughs> stronger relationship, yes. uh, not only with its neighbors, but with the Western world, which has been open to that. You know, our former foreign secretary, uh, Jack Straw, went many times to Tehran at the, in, at the end of the 1990s and, and early in the last decade, trying to set up between the European Union and Tehran a much stronger relationship, stronger in every sense, economically, uh, and a stronger political relationship. And one of the great disappointments for us is that that didn't work, that at a time when Europe was really open to that, uh, that didn't receive the, the response that we think that it ought to have had. And that makes us more cynical now, of course, uh, in, in our dealings, uh, more skeptical in our dealings with Iran now. We're still open to that. And that is why European nations are still so dedicated to a solution that provides Iran with peaceful nuclear energy yes. without presenting any threat to her neighbors or the rest of the world. Yes. Mr. Musa, you have uh, an First, I uh, never heard that Iran was the superpower of the Middle East. And we never accepted that uh, expression of certain international newspapers that are uh, very keen on just uh, giving such. Uh, there was not superpower. They did not have relations with most of the Arab countries at that time or bad relations. The superpower means a lot that they have the final say. Iran never had the final say in that region. So Iran was not a superpower when the Shah was ruling Iran. That's number one. Number two, Iran is part and parcel of the Middle East. It is there, it is not created 60 years ago, it's how thousands of years, with a very deep civilization and culture, and it is part of the Muslim world, of which we are also part. We have differences, as has been excellent, but this is not the, the place to enumerate how the, the differences between us and them, or between the policies, which I believe, I personally believe, and as Secretary General of the Arab League believe, that the only solution is to sit at a negotiating table or a dialogue table, all of us and the Iranians in order to solve the problems we have. Turkey is also lonely in the Middle East. But this does not give any country, because it is lonely, the uh, permission uh, or the, uh, that the, the reason yes. for it to, to go nuclear. Yes. And after all, if Israel is nuclear and Iran goes nuclear, we in the Middle East will feel lonely. Yes. We'll have also to be. <laughs> We're never lonely. I, Mr. Yeah. Rifai, I'll come back to you. Mr. Rifai, would you allow Israel to use your uh, uh, skies if they want to uh, launch any assault on Iran? Will you stop Israel? First of all, we're against any attack on Iran, period. So uh, uh, talking about, about allowing uh, use of Jordanian airspace, I think, is a, a redundant question by any uh, stretch of the imagination. Um, I just want to go back I, to the public and private uh, conversations that uh, publicly we are against Iran being attacked, privately we are against Iran being attacked, we are against is any... Is that true? Uh, and is that true, sir? I wouldn't be telling you that if it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, if, and most importantly, any conflict that is solved by another conflict or by military means cannot uh, yes. uh, be sustainable. Yes. 
And un unfortunately, this debate is about the balance of power. Yes. We should be concentrating about how to remove the balance of power and how to uh, put in the balance of peace. Europe, in uh, 70 years ago, yes. was going through the, exactly the same thing we did. They're not thinking about balance of power today. They're thinking about how to cooperate and how to support each other. I hope that we yes. we can do that all across the region. Mr. Janahi, quick intervention, and then we come to Mr. Yeah. Gergash. We, we, we've had around, what, 40 minutes so far? <laughs> Oh, tw 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 20, mi 20 minutes. Interesting that you say so, and you live in Bahrain. If we take the no, demographic, I, don't live in I live in Switzerland. Demographic, so just... demographic dimension of Bahrain. It's it's tough on you, huh, with Iran nuclear. No, it's not tough. No, oh, things may, are good. That's why I said I was just going to say, comment. Listening to politicians at the beginning and after 20 minutes, you get just more confused because I'm sure they're confused too. Because with your conclusion, by the way, which I disagree with, you said the problem is not Iran, but it's Palestine. Sorry, it's neither Iran nor Palestine. The problem is the Arabs themselves. They have to believe in themselves. I mean, when Amram Musa, I don't like to disagree with him on television, but I will. When he says Iran is not a superpower, I agree, Iran is not a superpower. Who has the final say in our part of the world? If you're going to tell me, I mean, Ali Ham Mr. Hamada's question is a very interesting one. When, when you ask Mr. Rafai in private and public, I would say maybe the politicians, the elites in private and public have different things, but the people don't. That's the public I'm talking about. And that's the interest that I'm interested in. I think eventually, whether we like it or not, in our part of the world, yes. uh, the power, unfortunately, there will be regional powers. And when I call regional powers, I'm calling Bimina, very broader Middle East. Whether we like it or not, Israel is there. Whether we like it or not, Turkey is there, and thank God Turkey is there. And whether we like it or not, Iran is there. Yes. And let's hope Saudi and Egypt will be there too. Let's hope so. That's but awesome. we cannot run away from that. Now, the question of nuclear, I mean, I love economists. And when Ms. Fayyad says we like Middle East free of any uh, nuclear uh, arms, that's not going to happen. You're right. Th this is Reality is we have it. Yes. Reality is. My worry is actually a question I was going to ask is not the question of Israel going overboard. When this gentleman is foreign minister in a couple of months and he goes to the House of Commons and he says, by the way, I have a report here from our uh, intelligence saying in 60 minutes, Iran can basically thrash us down. <laughs> and let's go for Iran. Did the deja vu what happened in yes. Iran? Yes. That is the worry I have with the Arabs. What are they going to do? And that's a question for Amr Musa and Mr. Probably Obama. you're the only one who can say this because you're not in an official position, not, not a minister, not a Thank foreign God. minister, not and a minister. And I can't minister. afford a tie either. So it's <laughs> Neither am I. <laughs> uh, so, مشاهدينا راح نتوقف للحظات قليلة مع فاصل لنعود إلى هذه الجلسة. نحن هنا في دافوس في المنتدى الاقتصادي العالمي. ابقوا معنا. So, let's continue. Okay. Peace process, sorry. Just I have to end Iran. <laughs> Who's making money? You're not paying money. But they don't. Yeah, I'm ready. Guys, when? Yalla. وين اي كاميرا فور اي حاجه دوره تاني يلا اهي اهي اهلا بكم مشاهدينا اهلا بكم مشاهدينا من جديد ونتابع هذه الجلسه الحواريه من دافوس المنتدى الاقتصادي العالمي حول موازين القوى في الشرق الاوسط dear viewers and audience uh, welcome back so the arabs all Arabs see Palestine as the mother cause for everything. Even extremists, even Iran, everyone in the area would go back to Palestine as the mother cause. Mr. Haig, 18 years of negotiations since Madrid. Uh, a lot of terrorism around the world in the name of Palestine and other also causes. And a lot of other uh, debates about peace, no peace. Why it's not happening? 
Well, to have peace, you have to have um, people agree that they are going to be peaceful with each other. And there are far greater experts on this panel than me about this subject, but it is one of the great frustrations for politicians from outside the Middle East because we want to help, we want to help bring that about. If we are in our own case, if the Conservative Party is elected to office in, in Britain in the coming general election, then putting some new British impetus into the Middle East peace process is a very important priority for us because it is true that so many of the issues in the Middle East and so many problems of the world stem from our inability uh, to resolve this situation. So uh, there will be no shortage of determination to do this. But we can see from how the Obama administration has given a lot of attention to this over the last year, yes. how easy it is for that to slow down, how easy it is for it to uh, lose momentum. And I think the United States and its allies, therefore, need to give it fresh momentum over the coming months. I'll allow me to repeat the exact quote of Mr. Obama. I'll be honest with you, this is really hard. This is just really hard. This is President Obama talking to Time magazine. Mr. Fayyad, you are insisting on freezing settlements before any talk on uh, peace or negotiations. You've lost time. Settlements are there. They're going to continue to mushroom all over Palestine. And no peace yet. Can we bl blame you on that? That doesn't make any, uh, our position wrong, by the way. And one key reason to answer your first question as to how or why this has been going on for as long as it has without resolution is because there, was, there has been massive failure in addressing what I generally call requirements for success. Requirements for success, by that I specifically mean that there are certain actions that need to be taken in a manner that can actually give confidence in the capacity of that political process to yield that which we all want to see, mainly an end of the Israeli occupation and the opportunity for us Palestinians to be able to have that independent, sovereign, viable Palestinian state emerge. On so the we have to wait another 18 seven. years, sir? No, we don't have to. How long? I think what is required is, again, I am troubled by the notion that uh, something is called unrealistic because of a prejudgment or determination that is not going to happen because Israel does not want it to happen. If we but now continue Palestinians to succumb to this look, logic, Palestinians, if we continue, if we continue Palestinians to this look logic, today as me, they are the ones who are stopping peace. If we, if we continue to succumb to this logic that something is not go going to happen because it is prejudged and reasonable, since Israel is not likely to accept it, I think we're going to be in this corner for a very long period of time. And it's not only Palestinians who are going to be blamed, I tell you, the issue is going to continue to go on unresolved to the detriment not only of Palestinians, but Israelis and the region at large. So the issue here is, does the world have the willpower to at long last say, enough already? These are requirements under international law. They have to be lived up to, both by Palestinians and Israelis. We have where we can done all we could <coughs> to actually live up to our obligations under international law, specifically roadmap. The question is, what has Israel done in connection with those obligations on the Israeli side? Yes. The answer is nothing. So long as that continues to be acceptable normal behavior, yes. I'm afraid that any political process that could be relaunched would be capable of delivering that which is required. That's really the issue for yes. us. It is, it's not as material as it is political. The question is how much faith can we have in the capacity of the political process to deliver once relaunched? Yes. If, in fact, the world has failed so demonstrably in bringing about compliance by Israel, or willingness by Israel to accept to stop violating international law. That's what settlement activity represents. It's violation of international law. If the world cannot bring that about, how confident can we be that the political process, once relaunched, would be capable yes. of delivering that outcome? Mr. That's Musa, the issue, really. Mr. Musa, so now we are waiting for the world also to be as aggressive with Israel as we want the world to be and stop settlements. You think, is, is this feasible? Will this happen? Of course it is feasible. If there is the right pressure and the right position taken by everybody. That's why we're waiting to see now, and not for long, the result of the current talks. Uh, I believe all of us agree that uh, success is not uh, uh, seen, or a light at the end of the tunnel is not very clear, after all those uh, visits and talks and proposals. I uh, think that we have to go to the United Nations again 
to the Security Council. Uh -huh. The marginalization of the United Nations in the mid-90s was a major mistake on our part, mm -hmm. that we accepted the notion of on an honest broker as opposed to the UN Charter and the international law. Honest broker did not bring us anywhere. No station on the whole long road. So we have to get back to the UN. But not to go and debate, or not to go and condemn, but to go and put a draft of peace yes. before the Security Council. And this draft is ready. Insofar as yes. We are concerned. Yes, we are. You are working on this. Palestinians are banking on a Security Council resolution uh, uh, to uh, admit Palestine as independent state with borders of 67. And uh, <coughs> would Britain back up such a plan? Well, I, I'm not the government of Britain, so what do I you can't, think? Not yet. Uh, anyway, in, in few um, in few if, months, if it is possible to by the time it's there, you will be no. Yeah, but obviously we can't say now how we will respond to a resolution we haven't seen in a few months' time after an election we haven't had. But if yes, if it is <laughs> if it is possible, though we will always be asked to do those things, uh, if it is possible to make progress in the United in the form of the United Nations, yeah, then yes, we are in favour of that. But it's very difficult to do so, of course, because in the Security Council. Council, there are vetoes, and yes. Mr. Malsan uh, knows that. Allow me I to make a comment here, please. On, uh, Mr. The Solana, hmm. was Solana. The, Javier Solana, this, the representative of the foreign policy of Europe, before he left a year, full year, he said that I see no hope. We have all to go, all, meaning Europe, the Arab world, we have all to go to the Security Council yes. and put the whole case But hmm. uh, Well, I'm not sure that's true. I mean, that is one uh, option. That is right. And, and by the way, so speaking for the British Conservative Party, we are certainly uh, very clear that we also need a complete stop to Israeli settlement activity uh, so that these discussions can yes. get going in a more but meaningful Mr. way. But there are other ways to do it, of the United States to produce proposals in more detail, uh, and yes. then outside the form of the United Nations for other nations to, to press those proposals forward. Mm -hmm. Mr. Haig, our audience, the normal Arab in the street, doesn't trust the West. And they think they're not doing enough for Palestine, and they think you are friends uh, of Israel on the account of Arabs. Uh, what do you do about this? How, how can we be convinced that the European Union, Britain, the West really now have realized the issue of Palestine as the mother cause, as the cause for many troubles in the Middle East? Well, I think, uh, by the way, I understand uh, whenever people in one part of the world don't trust people in another because of foreign policy complications, that is the normal uh, aspect of world affairs, unfortunately. But what we can do is make sure that in Western capitals, the Middle East peace process has the correct priority, which is the top priority yes. in international relations, and give our time and attention and impetus to that. And of course, we have among our friends, we count among our friends in the world, many, many nations of the Middle East, many of the Arab nations of the Middle East. Yes, we believe that Israel should be able to live in peace and security, but we also believe that that should be alongside a viable Palestinian state, also able to live in peace and yes. security. Mr. Rifai, let me pass to you this question from YouTube. A lot of people watched us on YouTube and had their own questions. This is from Selma, Washington, D.C. She says, what are Middle Eastern leaders doing to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian <clears throat> conflict? To what extent can resolving this conflict contribute to winning the war on modern terrorism? I think the question should be, what are they not doing uh, to achieve peace? I mean, they have... Uh, I'll talk, if I may, about Jordan. His, uh, uh, his Majesty, since he became king 10 years ago, has made it his priority to uh, seek uh, uh, peace for uh, not just uh, 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 the Palestinians, but the Arabs. Before that, Jordan, with his late Majesty, uh, spent all of his life uh, doing that. And his late Majesty, King Abdullah the I, was killed in Jerusalem for the yes. cause of peace. So we have been doing our utmost for peace because we realize that the alternative is disastrous. If you don't have peace, then there's more conflict and there's more bloodshed yes. and there's more strife yes. and people will continue to suffer. There has been enough suffering um, <clears throat> in both uh, uh, the Arab uh, world, Israel and in the entire world. I agree that a lot of uh, issues of terrorism either for uh, real or for yes. um, excuses have used the Palestinian issue 
uh, for that show. Yes. I think it will have an effect. I'll go back to the audience, but first I have to ask Mr. Gergash, then I'll, uh, please, if you prepare your questions. Mr. Gergash, we don't feel that the Gulf countries are as much involved in peace now with the Obama administration as much as they were with Clinton administration and Bush administration. Mm -hmm. Uh, on, on the contrary, on the contrary. How? I think that the Palestinian issue uh, is central. I think, and I'm speaking here for the UAE, we're very supportive of uh, the Arab uh, peace uh, process itself. I think we have a fantastic process. We're very supportive of the Palestinian Authority. And I think in many dimensions, on the political plane, uh, on the economic plane, and, uh, yeah, but the support usually, the, the support usually is money and, and, no, 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 and, no, 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 and food no, if there is any strike no, 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 on Gaza I, or Lebanon. No, no, you're not well informed on that. I am. Uh, no, you are not. I'm sorry to say it. Uh, 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 Representative Mitchell uh, is definitely in consultation. We are in, uh, all, you know, always in consultation with the Arab League, with the Palestinian Authority. And we think that the Palestinian Authority is doing an excellent job on more than one plane. And we think that everybody ought to support its position with regards to the settlements. Yes. Because that is a real no-go area without getting something on the settlement. That's been our position. Maybe we are sometimes a little bit like an iceberg. You can only see the tip of it. But I assure you, we work very hard underneath, and we try to support the position, because I think the Arab world has a very rational uh, position with regards to peace. Uh, we think in the Palestinian Authority, we have a partner who that is fully capable of bringing and implementing, but that partner needs tools. Yes. And the international community has got to give that partner these tools. Yes. Let's uh, go to the audience. Anyone would like to participate, please, to the, to the sir there? Can you please introduce yourself? Yes, I'm Praveen Mayer from New York University. Um, I have two comments. One, um, I read a book recently that said if women ruled the world. <laughs> so the men have tried and failed. Maybe we should turn it over to the women. Um, not yeah. one Arab woman ruler. <laughs> not one. Multiple women. Ruler. If women ruled not the yet. world. It's coming. Yeah, and it'll be a better and second, this is the world Men have failed. Yeah. And I figure one way to defeat all these problems would be economic development of Palestine, for example. I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that. Yes, Mr. Janahi, uh, economic development in Palestine, you as a businessman uh, in Bahrain, a businessman in Bahrain, in the Gulf, uh, you think you've done what's enough regarding investments in Palestine? Uh, how was the plan for this? Thank you very much for bringing that up. Uh, I mean, I've just been listening to the Palestinian issue, and I've just been hearing the same thing that I've been hearing for the past 20 or so years. I remember when Ayasa Arafat passed away, there was this issue of the corrupt Palestinian Authority. Everybody wanted elections. Everybody wanted democracy. It was done. We were here, actually, when the elections happened. And I would like, I always say, I said it at that time, and I would like to thank the Americans and the Israelis for having those, that clean elections that we had in 2006. And fortunately, Hamas came to power. Before that, we were working on a fund to basically work in the Palestinian territories to do some investment there. And we were working with the G7 to get some sort of basically insurance for political risk. But Fatah, Fatah no, no, is viewed as corrupt. No, no. We I'd don't want to, Hamas. I'd, I'd come to you from this what do you want? I'll come to you from this perspective. When we try to come in, immediately, I was in a session on the Palestinian Israeli issue. It was a dinner that we had here. At the, that day that the elections happened, there were congressmen there. Immediately, the issue was, you deal with Hamas, you are finished. It's the same thing with Arab governments. Unfortunately, when Hamas came through, I'm not pro-Hamas or pro-Fat, when Hamas came through, everybody stands still. Who is the superpower who's running the world in our part of the world? Why the Arab world? The business, we are part of it, and the governments stop supporting the Palestinian elected authority. Yes. Money was not going in. Electricity was not going in. I would not say that we are working, we're doing the right thing. Sorry, um, I mean, the reality is that we, when somebody tells us, be it this gentleman or somebody else, don't do it or you'll be suffering, we stop and we don't do it. That's why the issue of, and by the way, I would not say women rulers, I would say women leaders, 
because we need more of leaders than rulers. We yes. have sufficient rulers around yes. in business and in government. <laughs> so we need more leaders coming in. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, please, I have to take more questions. Uh, let's, let's talk to this lady over there since uh, we're talking about women leaders. Hello, it's Suna Vidinli. I'm a Turkish journalist. From... Please, sorry. I need to hear this on record. <laughs> this is not the issue. Huh? <laughs> My name is Suna Vidinli. I'm from Sabah newspaper. I'm a Turkish journalist. I've been listening to the conversation, how you were talking about resolutions being passed from United Nations and George Mitchell coming into the region. I totally agree with you. It's been the same thing over Always and over women again. Agree and with me, by people the way, ask, so why uh... isn't this situation changing? I'm not Arab, but I'm a fellow of Muslim. And the Quran says that God will not change your status until you change yourself yes. first. Yes. And it's a very important verse in the Quran. Yes. And I think that's Sorry. part of the reason why maybe Turkey doesn't need a nuclear power, because its yes. nuclear power are the people. Yes. So maybe instead of discussing balance of power in the Middle East, which in itself has a hidden threat, yes. if you're discussing balance of power, that means you're divided. Because yes. balance of power only happens within divided communities. Yes. And so you lose the battle before it's even fought. Sorry, I so have to I interrupt you. I'm I, running out of time. It's I, televised in the session. Face of, I mean, in the name of freedom of speech, I have to finish. No, no, no. It's, it's, uh, no. I think uh, for the sake of... No, it's televised, and I'm running out of time. I'll pass your question to Mr. Fayyad. You're not doing anything to yourself, so why do you expect others to do? I'm, I'm passing her question. I'm not sure that's entirely... Uh, accurate or fair. I mean, we've been trying to do the very best we can under uh, absolutely extremely difficult conditions, if not yes. impossible in many ways. The minister uh, has outlined some of them. They are very well known. We are under occupation. That's the uh, reality. Uh, yes. That's the, the most adverse reality that we have to face every day. Yes. Ending it is a, is a key challenge. And toward that end, we Palestinians are trying to do the very best we can uh, in the sense of working on a key deliverable of that political yes. process once relaunched. The Palestinian state, getting ready for statehood, is a Palestinian responsibility, and I think we are shouldering that responsibly, uh, with the help of the international community and Arab countries as well, included in that. But that's not enough. What is required is to have a political horizon to all of this, because absent that, our effort risks being and being seen as adapting to the reality of occupation, yes. as opposed to being an integral part yes. of the effort needed to end it. Yes. That is where we are most interested, keenly interested, in getting the political process restarted. Yes. Because we lose the most if it stays dormant. As, as you rightly pointed out, certain activity is ongoing, as are other violations or, or yes. other yes. aspects Mr. of Mr. Fayyad, I have to so interrupt we, you. We're trying to do the best we can. I have to wrap, just half a minute, Mr. Musa. Better to have peace process, even if it's slow and not working, than not having peace process at all or negotiations. I'm against deceiving the public opinion anymore. If there is a peace process, a meaningful, a serious one, we're all for it. If it is just for the a photo session and to tell people, wait, we are doing whatever we can, we are moving, etc., this will be again doing exactly the same mistake, the same trick that brought us to where, where we are today. Is peace process. We are for a peace process, definitely, and negotiating process, because we want to end this conflict. But it has to be a serious one, not one of the gimmicks that has played in the hand of the Israelis. Yes. Thank not you so much. Help the Arab. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, dear audience. I have to end this session now because time has run out. It's too early. Uh, شكرا جزيلا لمتابعة هذه الجلسة الحوارية. كنا معكم في من دافوس من المنتدى الاقتصادي العالمي والحوار كان حول موازين القوى في الشرق الأوسط. شكرا للمتابعة. إلى اللقاء. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Too many people. Thank you so much.